Did anyone come up with the demo or something today? Yes, Rajini has a demo. Okay. So, awesome. yeah, so before we start the demo, uh, anybody else has got any question that uh, we want to discuss? Uh, hi, Saurabh. Yeah, I've got questions. For yeah, I, you're, yeah, I just want to if you got anything on, on Dev, DevSecOps or be on the security side, any documents, any videos on that, please. Yeah, I think I just showed you. The, we, we did have a session on DevSecOps earlier. Uh, if you go into the mentorship guide, so it's in the extra mentorship sessions. So there's okay. one session on that. Yeah, one video there. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Thank yeah, you. So there's one video in there. So now you have integration with GitHub Actions. So that covers yeah. a bit of it. And plus, when you say uh, DevSecOps, in all the sessions, when we talk about security, whether it's either, whether it's security groups or whether it's encryption or whether it's the firewalls or whether it's uh, knuckles or in any sort of security that you think in terms of your cloud, in terms of your application, in terms of storage, that is a part of DevSecOps. So DevSecOps is, is not really a, a tool which you can just put in. So you can put in a lot of tools here, like uh, Trivi, you can put in Sonarcube. Uh, and uh, Raf, you will find those discussions in the DevSecOps uh, exclusive video that we have in there. You can have a look. But yes, DevSecOps sure. is not, not really something which is a tool by itself. It's it's a whole principle of how to secure your application and how to secure your cloud. Great. So thank you. You will find the the components of our discussion of DevSecOps in the in the in the routine discussions when we talk about the security, whether it be IAM or whether it be uh, using certificates, uh, whether it's SSL termination. So everything covers under DevSecOps. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I'll have a look. Thank you. Yeah. Cheers. Sure. Yep. So initially, I am going to start initializing the Python. So can can you before you do that? Uh, can you tell about what's the objective? What are we trying to do here? Yeah, what I'm, is this code about? Yeah, I am going to create a HTTP trigger function uh, using the Python programming language, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm going to deploy the function into a function app that I have already created in a Azure portal. Okay. Yep. So. I'm just using, I have already installed the fun, um, Azure function core tools in my system. And then I have installed the Azure functions extension in Visual Studio Code. And I'm running few commands uh, in order to be able to create that resource on the Azure portal. Mm -hmm. So initially, we uh, we are initializing the Python, Python function app. By, by running this command. I don't know if you can see the bottom of the video. Yeah, we can see that, yeah. Yep. A few moments later. All right, so, uh, so Rani, I've got a question for you. Yes. So if in case uh, you are in an interview and uh, you are asked, uh, have you used HTTP functions? And you would say yes. And uh, mm -hmm. your interviewer asks you about, tell me about the use case of the project where this helped you. How would you answer that? What was the use case for using HTTP function? What were you trying to achieve out of that function? Because we don't want to have any physical uh, server for the for our app to be uh, to be placed, so we don't have to create uh, any virtual machine for our app. So we don't need to deploy on the virtual machine. So we are just deploying on the function app. So yep. that's why it, it is called like serverless uh, yep. applications. Yeah. Yep. So it's, it's it's a lambda function in what that's what you call in AWS, which okay. is uh, which is triggered by an HTTP. Now there are multiple use cases for these type of functions. So the the first use case that you will often see is a uh, data transformation. So if it is if it is deployed if this function is deployed to an API endpoint, uh, you can you you can trigger that API endpoint. And, and do some some sort of transformation which can happen in a function so that can be the first use case the other use case uh, can also be in terms of uh, image conversions so for example if you have if you have an image based application where you are storing all the images as as they are uploaded onto your website uh, then you can do uh, those some sort of uh, transformation so that you can reduce the file size or you want to convert a jpeg into a pdf so that th these are the use cases where uh, these type of functions are used. So it's important to have, a, whenever you're doing something, it's important to have a context behind it. 
Uh, and uh, so so that whenever you are answering uh, in an interview or explaining it to someone, you all you always have a context as to what uh, this can be used for. And that goes a long way in in terms of uh, answering any sort of interview questions because uh, then you are elevating yourself not only from the technical point but only also towards the the requirements uh, that were expected of the technology why you would use function what are the different types of alternatives that were available why you chose to use a serverless uh, why don't you already use uh, something which is uh, which is within the application itself and also these are the few things that uh, that come up in interviews while you're discussing about a topic so but uh, yeah well well done rajni uh, so you did an attempt to it uh, and uh, you understood what a function is how it runs if anybody asks you uh, uh, you will be able to tell more about it uh, plus yeah. sometimes what happens is you guide the interview in a direction you want because you often uh, your interviewer would ask you okay tell me about a complex project that you have worked on so this is a very common question where where the ball is thrown at you and you can take it in any direction that you want so if you already have worked on uh, let's say you haven't worked on anything on azure and you have only worked on this function you can you can create a whole project where the a function was a central part of it and you can explain it in a way that this is this was the function that created the whole world out of it right and then because you know the intricacies of how the function works what are the different menu options in it you can start discussing on those many options uh, see interview is all about killing the time in a quality way it's nothing else if you are able to kill that 30 minutes or 45 minutes in a way where you command respect on the topics that you discuss that's all the interview is about and often you will get chances to take your interview in a direction that you know the best right so if if you haven't worked on anything you will you will always get a chance in an interview to point it to a direction where you have worked the most and because you have seen the many options because you know that okay a function can, can be triggered by not only http it can be triggered by n number of ways and all so you always get that sort of chance and that's the importance of doing hands on because once you get a chance and once you grab that opportunity you will be able to clear the interview with just that specific knowledge itself that's the beauty of it so once you understand whatever you do hands on that becomes a blessing if you can take your interview in that direction so you will find that useful yeah, rajni wow. yeah thank thank you so much sir all right guys please uh, do hands on uh, if you have not done it otherwise no no amount of course or teaching can help anybody right so it's one a, thing i am yeah. noticing is uh, i am i am i have done the same same type of uh, project uh, too many times before i came here but now i am facing facing any issues and i couldn't figure out how you know uh, where where is going wrong and these these are actually good things so yeah we are talking if you are getting a, if you are facing an issue and if i am an interviewer and i'm i'll ask you about the, the challenges that you have faced see i'll i'll tell you one interview we just went live yesterday uh, this girl has 13 years of experience and if if you get chance uh, we just watch the interview and i asked specifically a question tell me about a time where you faced challenges and she was not able to answer and that's the breaking point in your interview because i would not select a person with who has claimed n number of e e n number of years of experience and when i ask tell me about the the toughest project that you have worked on tell me about the challenges that you have faced and if you are not able to answer nobody would have that candidate right mm -hmm. so similar similarly the challenges that you are facing in these projects can make your interview because when you talk about these challenges the interviewer knows that you have some depth in you so challenges are good if you are able to resolve it very well done if you are not able to resolve it then also they help you a lot right because if if if, if there is a challenge which you are not able to resolve it there has to there will be some substance in the challenge itself right so it's worth talking about so and that is what uh, will really help you guys so for those who are not really attempting it god save you but for those who are done, trying to do yeah you are doing the right thing taking command in your hands
sorry guys i can't be more blunt than that but uh, unless you do hands on you're not doing yourself any service even joining the program or anything it will not help you have to no. struggle and spend a lot of time debugging writing serverless or terraform or everything so that's how uh, you become expert yep all right so there's no nothing else uh, sanjeev what's the plan for uh, this saturday saturday we will start terraform and i will suggest everyone do some basic learning or reading on terraform because even though i'll cover basics i'll start with basics but i want to take it to next level that how this is used in the organizations and some of the slightly advanced things with something i'll try to bring yeah sairam you got something to say yeah i have a small question like uh, organizations organizations use it to say like uh, we are uh, having skill set gap for employees and uh, we are looking for a skilled people how to figure out what organizations are looking for uh, how can we upgrade uh, like that kind of thing yep uh, like that's, uh, that's, a, that's like a very for, good question uh, like for example uh, kubernetes came into limelight at 2014 some lucky people has got hands on and uh, they have very good expertise up to now like that how to figure out what's going to be future and uh, how we can upscale now like that how can we update ourselves yeah see the first thing is to identify that the area of expertise that you want to be right so what's your target role let's let's say you have a target role for something that you have never done before right so let's let's say if i'm targeting uh, ai ml engineering i want i want to go in the next one year towards and and be a, a top quality ai engineer and i want to do a job in it uh, so how would i start learning what the companies want because if i have not seen anything on ai yet uh, it's a, it's a, it's an open slate so i would go first to the job portals try to identify what are the different technologies that they are asking for you know try to identify at least 70 to 80% of the common tech stack and the first thing that i'll target is uh, those tech stacks so that's that's your best bet because then you are working towards the most common path right so that these are technology so this is what same thing happens with kubernetes and docker as well right so when it came in suddenly you find that lots of companies all everybody is asking for mm-hmm. kubernetes same thing is with uh, with the ai ml currently so if you you are in gcp it's vertex ai uh, in aws it's sage maker essentially they are all the same concepts so incidentally i'm currently working on a project and in my company on on these technologies but for those who want to work on something new or you don't have any idea where to start with start up with uh, with a job portal try to identify what what are the common tech stacks uh, that everybody is looking for so you cannot cover everything under the sun but if you are if you are ready with around 60 70% uh, of the common technologies so that should uh, give you a kick start sandeep you want to add anything to it yeah i think there are so many things in mentorship program is uh, one such thing you uh, right now we are learning devops cloud but we will also try our best to you know identify those areas Uh, AI ML or Gen AI, and we will bring it. But do join such kind of events. Go to public uh, events that AWS or Azure is conducting. The progression is from this level only. It's not that something new has to be invented by you or, or yourself. Just look at what people are doing in the same career, in the same situation. What cloud? Where the cloud or uh, uh, these companies are moving to? so you will automatically uh, find a good road map for yourself for next few years thank you saurabh thank you yep. sanjeev so i'm not sure if anybody has noticed but there is a lot of ai projects that have started at least uh, uh, in my knowledge uh, even with my friends as well lots of ai projects are starting up uh, so I'll, for example uh, in an organization where i am working so we've got two types of major ai projects so one is your generative ai uh where it is more like a speech to text where you get speech from someone and you try to convert that into business language try to segregate it into different departments and uh, 
you make sense of that speech and then you convert it into text and uh, that is generative ai the other kind of projects in uh, aiml that is uh, about anomaly detection so whether it be a credit card fraud or whether if you are in an uh, telecom industry whether it's a something an anomaly in billing so or if you are in healthcare uh, which disease might go with another one so it's all about ingestion of the data and then trying to predict uh, based on the so you train your model and then you predict whether uh, this particular anomaly uh, is is positive or negative so so those uh, are the types of train our that... model uh, any third party will sell that data like uh, this kind of things will happen in credit card fraud like that and that that is where all your security comes into picture because if if let's say you are an organization and you have a third party coming up saying that okay i'll provide you a solution your organization will have to think okay if i provide the data to the third party entity is the is it a uh, what sort of data is it so you have a data classification right so you have got yes. uh, it can be a public data it can be private data it can be confidential it, it can be data. restricted so that that is where you have all these uh, architects uh, who who would decide and then you will have your security architects you will have your cloud architects you will have the application architects data architects they will all decide as to what are the different types of classifications what data we should be sending it whether the third party who is an external contractor how how much a trust can we build on it so these are all the different architectural challenges that come in uh, uh, that's where i am involved as well but uh, yeah so so you you can you can't blindly trust anything on that it all depends on the organizational uh, contractual obligations with the third party and uh, what sort of data that you are trying to send but there are lots and lots of ai projects which are just uh, coming in so they're just they're just popping left right and center so soon you will find that uh, in 3 4 years down the line the way that we had devops bursting into the industry in 3 years down the line people will be asking for two if you have got two years of ai ml expertise so so when people start asking they don't ask for a fresher in any sort of uh, segment they would start asking that okay have you already had 3 years of ai and then you'll wonder was the ai really in here 3 years before so but that's how the market is so those those who pioneer the new sort of tech stacks coming in uh, they are they are into the leading uh, game through the technology uh, so sort of so i think this devops also which helps in the ai uh, process also right like we have the ml ops as well so that's that's correct so that's that's where i said so when you are doing uh, uh, in the projects like anomaly detection or gen ai everything flows through the pipelines right so you you still use terraform to build those projects you still use ci cd to deploy those projects uh, some sort of projects also use uh, their workbench uh, which is which is their own pipeline as well so the concepts remain the same you still do the builds you still do the deployments the tools change but the basic fundamentals remain the same so whatever you are learning in here will go a very very long way in your ai career so devops is not different to how do i put it devops is not different to your ai ml so it's all embedded inside it so you have to still learn it but it's just a new tech stack that that will keep on using it the first people who will graduate to ai ml would be devops and cloud people that's correct and ai is ai is completely in, into the cloud nobody deploys their own ai servers on prem you have to use either of the three clouds ai so either gcp or azure or aws so unless and until you know the intricacies of cloud how cloud works what are the different services that that can be used and because ai is all uh, uh, into cloud itself it's bound to use the different services within cloud as well so unless you know cloud be it aws azure gcp you will not be able to enter into the field itself yeah right so this 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 is the first absolute mandatory stepping stone let me give one more perspective like i don't think 
when companies AWS, Azure, GCP, they started cloud uh, as an offering and we started learning it. We haven't built any cloud ourselves, right? We haven't, we are actually renting the cloud. So what we learned was how to use the cloud. That's what, that's what we are uh, learning, right? How to use the cloud. Cloud is being built by these three, four players. Same is probably going to be that the Gen AI models, not every company has the bandwidth and the capacity to build these models. These companies will build these models. Maybe uh, Meta will also join and few other big players will be there. Uh, just But AWS, Azure, or Google will always be there. So they will build the, uh, the models. They will expose these models as APIs. So just like uh, EC2, RDS, you will have Gen AI models available, which you can consume through APIs and build applications around it. So when we get into Gen AI, we will probably not be building new Gen AI models. We may not be building or, or uh, machine learning or that those kind of skills may not be needed that much. Maybe we don't need that much of Python ourselves. That's something uh, these big players will be doing. We have to learn how to consume it. And the consumption part is what we need to come up with. So that's where cloud knowledge will come because this will be another service. Like look at Bedrock in AWS. It, it's another, another service where different companies can list their models. So Meta uh, uh, models will be available. AWS own models will be available. And you pay for them, like what number of queries you make, uh, you will pay for it. But I think the roadmap to any Gen AI engineer or any uh, future in this will go through this path. They will first be told to learn cloud, a bit of DevOps, and then progress to Gen AI. And nobody not many about... companies will build their models. They will yeah. rent it. That's correct. Uh, so, so, but, uh, yeah, Sanju, uh, uh, Sanju's uh, told like just now. So it would be better just uh, will I mean learning like how to consume the AI, right? So so my question is like <laughs> yeah, once the model is developed and how to consume or how to prompt the model and that is enough for a good career or else like development of the complete AI, uh, learning the development of complete AI is a good enough. Like so, between these two, like which is the better option? You so, said. so when we say con consumption, it's not just prompting, right? It's not prompting. It's uh, It's consuming that model through APIs and then using the response in your application. So that's a complete uh, picture. I would say at least that uh, that role has to be completed, that complete thing, if you are not building. So obviously if you are building, if you have the capabilities to build models, that is going to be an amazing skill, but that requires a lot of Python and not just Python, a lot of analytics and mathematical knowledge, a different kind of algorithms and uh, fine tuning the algorithms and that that is one role obviously that is premium but even if you don't do that for example in cloud also if you have extensive knowledge of uh, very niche knowledge of networking uh, or uh, direct connect and strong knowledge in those areas then obviously it's a premium skill set compared to devops and cloud basic uh, you can create load balancer through terraform that's an average uh, skill set even though that is also at a premium compared to dotnet and java but Okay, so the premium skill set is you being able to build models. But even if you are not able to build models and you have uh, basic knowledge, then you should be able to consume those models and build your applications with that. So you will you will make API calls to those models, understand what request, what response that they are sending us. Then whether you are presenting it on a screen or whether you are passing it to another API or whatever you are doing with that response, that completing that picture, that would give the second uh, level of uh, knowledge. Even, 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 for example, now, a lot of people, they don't, they can't do all these activities. They need to understand DevOps Cloud, being able to consume those models and then create applications on top of that. And applications are not simple. Any, any company who is, in, who is into Gen AI, the use case will not be very straightforward. Being able to understand that use case and then design the application that way. And then issues with Gen AI that the response is not guaranteed uh, to be consistent 
same response all the time. So even if you test it today, uh, tomorrow what the API will respond, you, you really don't know. It's not a consistent response. So how to handle those scenarios? So there are a lot of other things, uh, but yeah, even that would be a good career. So I wouldn't call it a prompt engineering or just prompting on chat GPT and then building some uh, material. That is that is probably a, a data entry kind of thing. That's a diff very low in this entire Gen AI uh, uh, tool chain, but prompt from the point of view that you are able to enhance the use the Gen AI and then enhance your application. And we'll, we'll shortly, we are very not very far from that, uh, that we will be bringing Gen AI related uh, demos and projects for you guys. It's somehow within the team, once we get the confidence that you guys are comfortable with a Kubernetes cluster, a Terraform, and you are you are hitting those uh, those interviews and succeeding in them easily, we start getting that. We already seeing some hopes and like, uh, two or three people got selected at AWS itself and uh, a lot of other success stories are coming. But still, uh, the demos and that's why I'm encouraging people that you do hands-on, do as much as possible. And because right now, whatever premium in this these kind of jobs is also going to go away shortly if you don't move on to Gen AI. So we want to do ML ops. We want to do Gen AI. We want to do that bedrock. Uh... So one last out. Yes, Ankush. Do we have access for the previous batch, batch uh, tutorials on AWS or any other videos? Yes, we have all the, If again, we discussed in the last week's uh, discussion. We have recording of all the previous batches and um, AWS bootcamp and demos, but we would suggest you go through them only if you are in a hurry or you have some, you are able to meet the pace of the program that we are doing live. So if, if you have more time, then you do it. If you are you have limited time, then at least try to keep a pace with the program itself. Because live is our program sessions, to be very frank, are live in nature, where we allow a lot of question answers. So uh, sometimes a one hour session becomes two hours because their people are asking a lot of questions. They have done prep, they, they want to know advanced things. So a one hour session becomes two hours because there are questions and responses and then cross questions. You have seen this session itself, right? So yes, yes, yes. We move from one one topic to another, and one. So in live, it's sometimes useful that you are you have time and you are spending the time. But in 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 a different context, you are watching a recording. Uh, it it could be a lot of time. You will not know a lot of context to that question and all that. So exactly, yeah. Time, I would suggest to go through it. Uh, even to brush up or like uh, you can watch some of those previous uh, videos, but only if you are able to meet the pace of the current program, live program. Right now, every week there are assignments, focus on them. Yes, okay. But yeah, recordings point of view, it's all, all, all everything is open. You guys have the uh, PDF, which has all the links.